Buck Rogers is a fictional character who first appeared in a novella titled Armageddon 2419 AD by Philip Francis Nolan published in the August 1928 issue of the pulp magazine Amazing Stories as Anthony Rogers. A sequel, The Air Lords of Han, was published in the March 1929 issue. Philip Nolan and the syndicate John F. Dill Company, later known as the National Newspaper Syndicate, were contracted to adapt the story into a comic strip. After Nolan and Dill enlisted editorial cartoonist Dick Calkins as the illustrator, Nolan adapted the first episode from Armageddon 2419, AD and changed the hero's name from Anthony Rogers to Buck Rogers. The strip made its first newspaper appearance on January 7, 1929. Later adaptations included a serial film, a television series, and other formats. The Adventures of Buck Rogers in comic strips, movies, radio and television became an important part of American popular culture. This pop phenomenon paralleled the development of space technology in the 20th century and introduced Americans to outer space as a familiar environment for swashbuckling adventure. Buck Rogers has been credited with bringing into popular media the concept of space exploration, following in the footsteps of literary pioneers such as Jules Verne, H. G. Wells, and Edgar Rice Burroughs. Characters and Story The character first appeared as Anthony Rogers, the central character of Nolan's Armageddon 2419 AD born in 1898. Rogers is a veteran of the Great War and by 1927 is working for the American Radioactive Gas Corporation investigating reports of unusual phenomena reported in abandoned coal mines near Wyoming Valley in Pennsylvania. On December 15, there is a cave in while he is in one of the lower levels of a mine. Exposed to radioactive gas, Rogers falls into a state of suspended animation, free from the ravages of catabolic processes, and without any apparent effect on physical or mental faculties. Rogers remains in suspended animation for 492 years. Rogers awakens in 2419. Thinking that he has been asleep for just several hours, he wanders for a few days in unfamiliar forests. He notices someone clad in strange clothes, who is under attack. He defends the person, Wilma Deering, killing one of the attackers and scaring off the rest. On a Euro or a patroller Euro, Deering was attacked by an enemy gang, the Bad Bloods, presumed to have allied themselves with the Hans. Wilma takes Rogers to her camp, where he meets the bosses of her gang. He is invited to stay with them or leave and visit other gangs. They hope that Rogers a Euro unregistered trademark experience and knowledge he gained fighting in the First World War may be useful in their struggle with the hands who rule North America from 15 great cities they established across the continent. They ignored the Americans who were left to fend for themselves in the forests and mountains as their advanced technology prevented the need for slave labor. In the sequel, The Air Lords of Han, Six months have passed and the hunter is now the hunted. Rogers is now a gang leader and his forces, as well as the other American gangs, have surrounded the cities and are attacking constantly. The Air Lords are determined to use their fleet of airships to break the siege. In 1933, Nolan and Calkins co-wrote Buck Rogers in the 25th century, a novella that retold the origin of Buck Rogers and also summarized some of his adventures. A reprint of this work was included with the first edition of the 1995 novel Buck Rogers, A Life in the Future by Martin Caden. In the 1960s, Nolan's two novellas were combined by editor Donald A. Wallheim into one paperback novel, Armageddon 2419 AD. The original 40-cent edition featured a cover by Ed M. Schwiller. Comic Strip, the story of Anthony Rogers and Amazing Stories caught the attention of John F. Dill, president of the National Newspaper Service Syndicate, and he arranged for Nolan to turn it into a strip for syndication. The character was given the nickname Buck, and some have suggested that Dill coined that name based on the 1920s cowboy actor, Buck Jones. On January 7, 1929, the Buck Rogers in the 25th Century AD comic strip debuted. Coincidentally, this was also the date that the Tarzan comic strip began. The first three frames of the series set the scene for Buck's leap 500 years into Earth's future, I was 20 years old when they stopped the World War and mustered me out of the air service. I got a job surveying the lower levels of an abandoned mine near Pittsburgh, 
in which the atmosphere had a peculiar pungent tang and the crumbling rock glowed strangely. I was examining it when suddenly the roof behind me caved in and Buck is rendered unconscious, and a strange gas preserves him in a suspended animation or coma state. He awakens and emerges from the mine in 2429 AD, in the midst of another war. After rescuing Wilma, he proves his identity by showing her his American Legion button. She then explains how the Mongol Reds emerged from the Gobi Desert to conquer Asia and Europe and then attacked America starting with that big idol holding a torch. Using their disintegrator beams, they easily defeated the Army and Navy and wiped out Washington, D.C. in three hours. As the people fled the cities, the Mongols built new cities on the ruins of the major cities. The Mongols left the Americans to fend for themselves as their advanced technology prevented the need for slave labor. The scattered Americans formed loosely bound organizations or orgs to begin to fight back. Wilma takes Buck back to the Allegheny organ what was once Philadelphia. The leaders don't believe his story at first but after undergoing electro-hypnotic tests, they believe him and admit him into their group. On March 30, 1930, a Sunday strip joined the Buck Rogers Daily Strip. There was, as yet, no established convention for the same character having different adventures in the Sunday Strip and the Daily Strip, so the Sunday Strip at first followed the adventures of Buck's young friend Buddy Deering, Wilma Deering's younger brother, and Buddy's girlfriend Allura, later joined by Black Barney. It was some time before Buck made his first appearance in a Sunday Strip. Other prominent characters in the strip included Buck's friend Dr. Hugh, who punctuated his speech with the exclamation, Hey! The villainous killer Kane and his paramour Ardala. And Black Barney, who began as a space pirate but later became Buck's friend and ally. In addition, Buck and his friends encountered various alien races. Hostile species Buck met included the Tiger Men of Mars, the dwarf like asteroids of the asteroid belt and giant robots called Mechanos. Like many popular comic strips of the day, Buck Rogers was reprinted in Big Little Books. Illustrated text adaptations of the Daily Strip stories. And in a Buck Rogers pop-up book. Nolan is credited with the idea of serializing Buck Rogers, based on his novel Armageddon 2419 and its Amazing Stories sequels. Nolan approached John Dill, who saw the opportunity to serialize the stories as a newspaper comic strip. Dick Hawkins, an advertising artist, drew the earliest daily strips, and Russell Keaton drew the earliest Sunday strips. The author of Buck Rogers told the inventor of Buckminster Fuller in 1930 that he frequently used Fuller's concepts for his cartoons. Keaton wanted to switch to drawing another strip written by Hawkins, Skyroads, so the syndicate advertised for an assistant and hired Rick Yeager in 1932. Yeager had formal art training at the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts and was a talented watercolor artist. All the strips were done in ink and watercolor. Yeager also had connections with the Chicago newspaper industry, since his father, Charles Montrose Yeager, was the publisher of The Modern Miller. Rick Yeager was at one time employed to write the auntie's advice column for his father's newspaper. Yeager quickly moved from inker and writer of the Buck Rogers substrip to writer and artist of the Sunday Strip and eventually the Daily Strips. Authorship of early strips is extremely difficult to ascertain. The signatures at the bottoms of the strips are not accurate indicators of authorship. Corkin's signature appears long after his involvement ended and few of the other artists signed the artwork, while many pages are unsigned. Yeager probably had complete control of Buck Rogers' Sunday strips from about 1940 on, with Lend Walkins joining later as assistant. Dick Locker was also an assistant in the 1950s. For all of its reference to modern technology, the strip itself was produced in an old-fashioned manner a Euro all strips began as India ink drawings on Strathmore paper, and a smaller duplicate was hand-colored with water colors. Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, has an extensive collection of original artwork. The strip's artists also worked on a variety of tie-in promotions such as comic books, toys and model rockets. Buck Rogers was popular enough to inspire other newspaper syndicates to launch their own science fiction strips. The most famous of these imitators was Flash Gordon. 
others included Jack Swift, Britt Bradford, Don Dixon and the Hidden Empire, Speed Spaulding, and John Carter of Mars. The relations between the artists of the strip and the owners of the strip became acrimonious, and in mid-1958, the artists quit. Murphy Anderson was a temporary replacement, but he did not stay long. George Tusker began drawing the strip in 1959 and remained until the final installment of the original comic strip, which was published on July 8, 1967. Revived in 1979 by Gray Morrow and Jim Lawrence, the strip was retitled Buck Rogers in the 25th century in 1980. Longtime comic book writer Carrie Bates signed on in 1981, continuing until the strip's 1983 finale. Radio in 1932, the Buck Rogers radio program, notable as the first science fiction program on radio, hit the airwaves. It was broadcast in four separate runs with varying schedules. Initially broadcast as a 15-minute show on CBS in 1932, it was on a Monday through Thursday schedule. In 1936, it moved to a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule and went off the air the same year. Mutual brought the show back and broadcast it three days a week from April to July 1939 and from May to July 1940, a 30-minute version was broadcast on Saturdays. From September 1946 to March 1947, Mutual aired a 15-minute version on weekdays. The radio show again related the story of our hero Buck finding himself in the 25th century. Actors Matt Crowley, Curtis Arnold, Carl Frank and John Larkin all voiced him at various times. The beautiful and strong world Wilma Deering was portrayed by Adele Ronson, and the brilliant scientist inventor Dr. Hugh was played by Edgar Schelley. The radio series was produced and directed by Carlo D'Angelo and later by Jack Johnston. In 1988, Johnston recalled how he worked with the sound effects of Aura Nichols to produce the sound of the rockets by using an air conditioning vent. Film and television adaptations. Equals World's Fair equals, a 10-minute Buck Rogers film premiered at the 1933 Euro 1934 World's Fair in Chicago. John Dill Jr. starred in the film, which was called Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, an interplanetary battle with the Tiger Men of Mars. A 35mm print of the film was discovered by the filmmaker's granddaughter, donated to UCLA's film and television archive was struck and subsequently posted to the web. It is now available on the VCI Entertainment DVD 70th anniversary release. Equals Department Store Promotion Movie Equals, a live-action short film was produced in 1936, designed to be shown in department stores to promote Buck Rogers merchandise. It was shot in the Action Film Company studio in Chicago, Illinois, directed by Dr. Harlan Tarbell. The characters included Buck Rogers, Wilma Deering, Dr. Hugh, Killer Kane, Ardala, King Grallo of the Martian Tiger Men, and Robots. Equals movie serial equals. A 12-part Buck Rogers serial film was produced in 1939 by Universal Pictures Company. Buck Rogers and his young friend Buddy Wade get caught in a blizzard and are forced to crash their dirigible in the Arctic wastes. In order to survive until they can be rescued. They inhale their supply of Nirvana gas which puts them in a state of suspended animation. When they are eventually rescued by scientists, they learn that 500 years have passed. It is now 2440. A tyrannical dictator named Killer Kane and his henchmen now run the world. Buck and Buddy must now save the world, and they do so with the help of Lieutenant Wilma Deering and Prince Torlan of Saturn. The serial had a small budget and saved money on special effects by reusing material from other stories, background shots from the futuristic musical Just Imagine, as the city of the future, the garishly stenciled walls from the Ezra Palace set in Flash Gordon's trip to Mars, as Kane's penthouse suite, and even the studded leather belt that Crab wore in Flash Gordon's trip to Mars turned up as part of Buck's uniform. Between 1953 and the mid-1970s, this film serial was edited into three distinct feature film versions. Equals 1950 Euro 1951 ABC television series equals, the first version of Buck Rogers to appear on television debuted on ABC on April 15, 1950 and ran until January 30, 1951. 
Its time slot initially was on Saturdays at 6 p.m., and each episode was 30 minutes. Later, the program was rescheduled to Tuesday at 7 p.m., where it ran against the popular Texaco Star Theater hosted by Milton Berle. Buck Rogers finds himself in the year 2430. Based in a secret lab in a cave behind Niagara Falls, Buck battles intergalactic troublemakers. There were a number of changes to the cast during the show's short duration. Three actors played Buck Rogers in the series, Earl Hammond, Kem Dibbs and Robert Parson. Two actresses portrayed Wilma Deering, Eva Marie Saint and Lou Prentice. Two actors would also play Dr. Hugh, Harry Southern and Sanford Bacart. The series was directed by Babette Henry, written by Jean Wyckoff and produced by Joe Katz and Henry. The series was broadcast live from station WENR-TV, the ABC affiliate in Chicago. There are no known surviving kind scopes of the first Buck Rogers television series. Equals Motion Picture and 1979 A Euro 1981 NBC television series equals. In 1979, Buck Rogers was revived and updated for a primetime television series for NBC Television. The pilot film was released to cinemas on March 30, 1979. Good box office returns led NBC to commission a full series, which started in September 1979. Glenn A. Larson produced the film and the first season of the eventual series. The series starred Gil Gerard as Captain William Buck Rogers, a United States Air Force and NASA pilot who commands Ranger 3, a space shuttle-like ship that is launched in 1987. When his ship flies through a space phenomenon containing a combination of gases, his ship's life support systems malfunction and he is frozen and left drifting in space for 504 years. By the time he is revived, he finds himself in the 25th century. There. He learns that the Earth was united following a devastating global nuclear war that occurred in the late 20th century, and is now under the protection of the Earth Defense Directorate, headquartered in New Chicago. The latest threat to Earth comes from the space-borne armies of the planet Draconia, which is planning an invasion. Co-starring in the series were Aaron Gray as crack starfighter pilot Colonel Wilma Deering, and Tim O'Connor as Dr. Elias Hugh, head of Earth Defense Directorate and a former star pilot himself. Ardala appeared, as a draconian princess supervising her father's armies, with Kane as her enforcer, a gender reversal of the original characters where Ardala was Killer Kane's sidekick. Although Black Barney did not appear as a character in the series, there was a character named Barney Smith who appeared in the two-part episode, The Plot to Kill a City. New characters added for the series included a comical robot named Twiki, who becomes Buck's personal assistant, and Dr. Theopolis, a sentient computer that Twiki often carries around. The series ran for two seasons on NBC. Production and broadcast of the second season was delayed by several months due to the 1980 actors' strike. When the series returned in early 1981, its core format had been revised. Now rather than defending Earth, Buck and Wilma were aboard the deep space exploration vessel Searcher on a mission to track down the lost colonies of humanity. Tim O'Connor's Dr. Hugh was written out of the series and replaced by Wilfred Hyde White as quirky scientist Dr. Goodfellow and Broadway character actor Jay Garner as Vice Admiral Efraim Asimov of the Earth Force. Also on board was the Christopher playing the role of Hawk, a stoic birdman in search of other members of his ancient race. The revamp was unsuccessful and the series was cancelled at the end of the 1980 Euro 1981 season. Two novels based on the series by Addison E. Steele were published, a novelization of the 1979 feature film, and That Man on Beta, an adaptation of an unproduced teleplay. Equals Future Films Equals, Frank Miller was slated to write and direct a new motion picture with Odd Lot Entertainment, the production company that worked with Miller on The Spirit. However, after The Spirit became an embarrassing box office and critical failure, Miller's involvement with the project ended. Role-playing games and video games. Equals Buck Rogers XXVC equals. In 1988, TSR, Inc. created a game setting based on Buck Rogers, called Buck Rogers XXVC. Many products were produced that were set in this universe, including comic books, novels, 
role-playing game material and video games. In the role-playing game, the player characters were allied to Buck Rogers and NEO in their fight against Ram. The games also extensively featured Guineas. The Gamma play of the Buck Rogers, Battle for the 25th Century board game by TS are dealt with token movement and resource management. There is purported to be a single expansion for the board game called the Martian Wars Expansion, but it is not known if this was ever released. Books, from 1990 to 1991 Ten comics modules set in the Buck Rogers XXVC universe were published, entitled Road Awakening No. 1 No. 3, Black Barney No. 1 No. 3 and Martian Wars No. 1 No. 4. These shared the numbering as a series issues No. 1 No. 10 with issue No. 10 as a flip book with Intruder No. 10. There has been speculation that two more stories were printed but not widely distributed. Ten paperback novels set in the XXVC universe were published, starting in 1989, Arrival by Flint Dill, Abigail Irvin, Melinda Seabrook Murdoch, Jerry Olshan, Ulrich O'Reilly and Robert Sheckley, The Martian Wars Trilogy, Rebellion 2456 by M.S. Murdoch, Hammer of Mars by M.S. Murdoch, Armageddon of Vesta by M.S. Murdoch, The Inner Planets Trilogy, First Power Play by John Miller, Prime Squared by M.S. Murdoch, Matrix Cubed by Britton Bloom, Invaders of Karen Trilogy, The Genesis Web by Ellen C. and Theodore M. Brennan, Nomads of the Sky by William H. Keith, Jr. Warlords of Jupiter by William H. Keith, Jr. Pinball, at the beginning of 1980, a few months after the show debuted, Gottlieb came out with a Buck Rogers pinball machine to commemorate the resurgence of the franchise. Video games in 1990, Strategic Simulations, Incorporated released a Buck Rogers XXVC video game, Countdown to Doomsday, for the Commodore 64, IBM PC, Sega Mega Drive, and other platforms. It released a sequel, Matrix Cubed, in 1992. Equals High Adventure Cliffhangers equals, in 1995, TSR created a new and unrelated Buck Rogers role-playing game called High Adventure Cliffhangers. This was a return to the themes of the original Buck Rogers comic strips. This game included biplanes and interracial warfare, as opposed to the space combat of the earlier game. There were only a few expansion modules created for High Adventure Cliffhangers. Shortly afterward, the game was discontinued, and the production of Buck Rogers RPGs and games came to an end. This game was neither widely advertised nor very popular. There were only two published products, The Box Set, and War Against the Han. Equals Planet of Zoom video game equals, Sega released the arcade video game Buck Rogers, Planet of Zoom in 1982. It was a forward-scrolling rail shooter where the user controls a spaceship in a behind-the-back third-person perspective that must destroy enemy ships and avoid obstacles. The game was notable for its fast pseudo-3D scaling and detailed sprites. The game would later go on to influence the 1985 Sega hit Space Area, which in turn influenced the 1993 Nintendo hit Star Fox. In Japan, the game was known as Zoom 909, a title shared by the smooth conversion of the game for the Sega SG-1000 console. Buck is never seen in the game except assumedly in the illustration on the side of the arcade cabinet, and its only real connections to Buck Rogers are the use of the name and the outer space setting. Home versions were released for the Atari 2600, Atari 5200, Atari XE, Coleco Vision, Coleco Adam, Intellivision, MSX and Sega SG-1000 video game systems, and the Commodore VIC-20, Commodore 64, Texas Instruments TI-99 Quarters A, Apple II and ZX Spectrum computers. A version for IBM PC using CGA graphics was also available. Later novels, authorized sequels to Armageddon 2419 AD were written in the 1980s by other authors working from an outline co-written by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell and loosely tied in with their 1977 bestseller Lucifer's Hammer. The first sequel begins C. 2476 AD, when a widowed and cantankerous 86-year-old Anthony Rogers is mysteriously rejuvenated during a resurgence of the presumed extinct Han, now called the Prolin. The novels include, 
Mordred by John Eric Holmes, Warrior's Blood by Richard S. McEnroe, Warrior's World by Richard S. McEnroe, Rogers Rangers by John Silbersack. Numerous novelists have reimagined or adapted the Buck Rogers mythos over the years, including Buck Rogers, A Life in the Future by Martin Caden, a standalone novel retelling the original story. Toys The first Buck Rogers toys appeared in 1933. Four years after the newspaper strip debuted and a year after the radio show first aired. Some mark this as the beginning of modern character based licensed merchandising, in that not only was character's name and image were branded on many unrelated products but also on many items of merchandise unique to or directly inspired by that character. Of the many toys associated with Buck Rogers, none is more closely identified with the franchise than the eponymous toy ray guns. The first Buck Rogers gun wasn't technically a ray gun, although its futuristic shape and distinctive lines set the pattern for all space guns that would follow. The XZ-31 rocket pistol, a 9 one half inch pop gun that produced a distinctive zap. Sound, was at the American Toy Fair in February 1934. Retailed for 50 a cent, which was by no means inexpensive during the Great Depression. It was designed to mimic the rocket pistol seen in the comic strips from their inception. In the comics, there were automatic pistols that fired explosive rockets instead of bullets, each round as effective as a 20th century hand grenade. The XZ-31 rocket pistol was the first of six toy guns manufactured over the next two decades by Daisy, which had an exclusive contract with John Dill, then head of the National Newspaper Syndicate of America for all Buck Rogers toys. Most of these were pop guns, which had the virtue of being noisemakers that couldn't fire any actual projectiles and were thus guaranteed to be harmless as one of their selling points. The XZ-35 rocket pistol, a smaller 7-inch version without some of the detail of the original that's often called the Wilma pistol by collectors, followed in 1935. Retailing for 25 a cent and arguably offering less value for quintuple the initial price. Most consumers hardly noticed, because in 1935 the floodgates were opened and they had a lot choices. Both the XZ-31 and XZ-35 were cast in blued steel with silvery nickel accents. The XZ-38 disintegrator pistol, the first actual ray gun toy and such an iconic symbol of the franchise that it made a cameo appearance in the first episode of the 1939 movie serial, as if to show that what the audience was seeing was indeed the real thing debuted in 1935. It was a 10-inch pop gun topped with flint and striker sparkler using a mechanism not unlike that used in cigarette lighters, cast in a distinctive metallic copper color. The XZ-44 liquid helium water pistol was produced in late 1935 and early 1936. Loaded like a syringe by dipping nozzle into a container of water and drawing back a plunger, it was advertised to be capable of shooting 50 times without reloading. In 1946, following World War II and the advent of the atomic bomb, Daisy reissued the XZ-38 in a silver finish that mimicked the new jet aircraft of the day as the U-235 atomic pistol. By then, pop guns were considered old-fashioned, and even the Buck Rogers franchise was losing its luster having been overtaken by real-world events and the prospect of actual manned space flight. By 1952, Daisy lost its exclusive license to the Buck Rogers name and even dropped any pretense of making a toy ray gun. Its final offering was a reissue of the XZ-35 with a garish red, white, blue and yellow color scheme, dubbed the Zucker. The Buck Rogers rocket pistol that had started it all 20 years earlier had been overtaken by the real-world bazooka. Space guns in general and ray guns in particular only gained in prestige as the Cold War space race began and interest in the Buck Rogers stuff was renewed, but it was no longer enough to offer a futuristic cap or pop gun. A proper ray gun needed to actually project some sort of ray if it were to capture the imaginations of would-be space travelers of 1950s Americans. End of the era of the plastic battery-powered flashlight ray gun. In 1953, Norton Hohner introduced the sonic ray gun, which was essentially a 7 or one half inch flashlight mounted on a pistol grip. Pressing the trigger activated not only the flashlight beam but also an electronic buzzer. It could therefore be used as a pretend ray gun but also as an actual Morse code signal device. 
This toy, and its successor, the Norton Homer supersonic ray gun, was featured prominently in the actual Buck Rogers newspaper strips of the time, many of which concluded with a secret message in a Morse code variant called the Rocket Rangers International Code, the key to which was available only by sending a self-addressed stamped envelope to the newspaper syndicate or the cheat sheet included in the package with the toy. In 1934, a rocket police patrol ship wind-up red and green tin toy spaceship was produced by Louis Marx and company with Buck seated in the cockpit holding a ray gun rifle. A second orange and yellow patrol ship was released the same year by Marx with window profile portraits of both Wilmer and Buddy Deering on the right side and Buck and Dr. Heuer on the left side. Both tin toys are in the collection of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. In 1936, a line of Buck Rogers painted lead metal toy soldier three-inch figures were made for the UK market. These were a set of six British premium figures for cream of wheat and included Buck, Dr. Hugh, Wilma, Kane, Ardala and an unidentified Meccano Man robot. In 1937, Tootsie Toys put out a six-piece die-cast metal set of four 5 a euro cube long spaceships and two 1.75 a euro cube tall figures of Buck and Wilma. In 2009 and 2011, two versions of Buck Rogers action figures were released by the entertainment toy companies Go Hero and Zyka Toys. The first is a vintage version of Buck Rogers as he appeared in the original comic strip. This one six scale figure of Buck wears the 1930s period uniform, including visor leather like plastic helmet and vest, a glass bubble space helmet, a red light up plastic flame jet pack a mini gold-colored metal XZ-38 disintegrator ray pistol and a wooden slotted lid box with the limited edition number up to 1000. The second 1-9 scale figure is based on Gil Gerard wearing the white flight suit from the 1979 movie TV show and also features a Tigerman figure. Comic books Over the years, there have been many Buck Rogers appearances in comics as well as his own series. Buck appeared in 69 issues of the 1930s comic Famous Funnies, then two appearances in Vicks Comics, both published by Eastern Color Printing. Then in 1940 Buck got his own comic entitled Buck Rogers which lasted for six issues, again published by Eastern Printing. In 1933, Whitman produced 12 Buck Rogers adventure comics. Kellogg's Serial Company produced two Buck Rogers giveaway comics one in 1933 and again in 1935. In 1951, Toby Press released three issues of Buck Rogers, all reprints of the comic strip. In 1955, an Australian company called Atlas Productions produced five issues of Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Gold Key Comics published a single issue of a Buck Rogers comic in 1964. A second series was based on the 1979 television series and was published from 1979 to 1982, first by Gold Key, then by Whitman Publishing, continuing the numbering from the 1964 single issue. TSR, Incorporated published a 10-issue series based on their Buck Rogers XXVC game from 1990 to 1991. In 2009, Dynamite Entertainment began a monthly comic book version of Buck Rogers by writer Scott Beatty and artist Carlos Rafael. The first issue was released in May 2009. The series ran 13 issues plus an annual, later collected into two trade paperbacks. In 2012, Hermes Press announced a new comic book series with artwork by Howard Chaikin. The series was collected into a graphic novel titled Howard Chaikin's Buck Rogers Volume 1. Grievous Angels in 2014. Web series, the Cooley Entertainment Company in 2009 announced it would produce a web series, Buck Rogers in the 25th Century in association with the Dill Family Trust. The series was purported to be based on the original comic strip and shows how Rogers is propelled from World War I into the 25th century. It was to star Bobby Quinn Rice in the title role of Lucas Buck Rogers. Gil Gerard and Aaron Gray who played Rogers and Deering in the 1979 movie and television series, was set to appear in the first episode as Buck Rogers' parents, and Samantha Gray his song to play Madison Gale. A teaser scene with Gerard and Gray was released on YouTube in May 2010, announced for week casting on the Internet in 2010.
The series never materialized and all references to it on the Internet Movie Database have been deleted. A May 4, 2011 article purported that the project was dead, citing comments from Gerard and Gray. A Kickstarter crowdsourced funding effort failed to reach its goal, and no official word as to the status of the project from the producers has been released since the Kickstarter effort. Influence on language and popular culture Buck Rogers' name has become proverbial in such expressions as Buck Rogers' outfit for a protective suit that looks like a space suit. For many years, all the general American public knew about science fiction was what they read in the funny papers, and their opinion of science fiction was formed accordingly. Another phrase in common use before 1950 was for deriding science fiction fans about that crazy Buck Rogers stuff. Such was the fame of Buck Rogers that it became the basis for one of the most fondly remembered science fiction spoofs in a series of cartoons in which Daffy Duck portrayed Duck Dodgers. The first of these was Duck Dodgers in the 24 or 1 half th century, which was directed by Chuck Jones in 1953. There were also two sequels to this cartoon, and ultimately a Duck Dodgers television series. Buck Rogers' comic strip is featured in Steven Spielberg's blockbuster sci-fi movie, E.T. The Extraterrestrial. E.T. is inspired to create a makeshift communicating device by copying Buck Rogers. The Buck Rogers appellation has become a particular descriptive term for vertical landings of spaceships, which was the predominant mode of rocket landing envisioned in the pre-space flight era at the time the Buck Rogers character made his original appearance. While many science fiction authors and other depictions in popular culture showed rockets landing vertically, typically resting after landing on the space vehicle's fins, Buck Rogers seems to have gained a special place as a descriptive compound adjective. For example, this view was sufficiently ingrained in popular culture that in 1993, following a successful low-altitude test flight of a prototype rocket, a writer opined, the DCX launched vertically, hovered in mid-air. The spacecraft stopped mid-air again and, as the engines throttled back, began its successful vertical landing. Just like Buck Rogers. In the 2010s, SpaceX rockets have likewise seen the appellation to Buck Rogers in a quest to create a Buck Rogers reusable rocket. Or a Buck Rogers dream. The animated television series Futurama, created by Matt Groening and David X. Cohen in 1999, was strongly influenced by themes and characters from the Buck Rogers comic strip, as well as many other science fiction books and films. Buck Rogers was a hit single by British rock band Feeder in 2001. The Foo Fighters' 1995 self-titled album features Buck Rogers' XZ-38 disintegrator pistol on the album's cover. Track 9 of Hiffy Bay Area rapper Mac Dree's album Heart of a Gangster, Mind of a Hustler, Tongue of a Pimp is titled Black Buck Rogers. In The Right Stuff, the 1983 film about the U.S. supersonic test pilots of the 1940s and 1950s and the early days of the U.S. space program, in one scene, the character of the Air Force liaison man tells test pilots Chuck Yeager and Jack Ridley and test pilots and future Mercury 7 astronauts Gus Grissom. Deke Slayton and Gordon Cooper about the need for positive media coverage in order to assure continued government funding for the rocket program, dramatically declaring no bucks, no buck rogers. In a later scene in which the seven astronauts confront the NASA rocket scientists who have been running the program to demand changes to allow them to fly their spacecraft as actual pilots rather than as mere passive passengers in vehicles totally controlled from the ground a Euro threatening to reveal to the press how they were being marginalized despite their public status as heroes, which would in turn damage congressional support for the programmer Euro Cooper, Grissom and Slayton repeat the no bucks no buck rogers speech to the startled scientists to make their point. See also Britt Bradford, Dan Dare, Flash Gordon References External links 1. Strickler, Dave. Syndicated Comic Strips and Artists, 1924 Euro 1995, The Complete Index Cambria, California, Comics Access, 1995 ISBN 0-9700077-0-1. Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, checked November 19, 2011 A Euro not available, Buck Rogers at DMOZ. Equals audio video equals, 
public domain Buck Rogers radio serials.